the idea that you can address this issue by suing Kia, by suing Hyundai. This is like suing a pencil manufacturer because somebody keeps making spelling errors. I mean, this is so wild. Um, auto theft is a symptom. The laws incentivizing criminal behavior, that's the actual disease. And the car manufacturers aren't even a part of the mathematical equation. Brandon Johnson, the new mayor of Chicago, blames the car manufacturers, Kia and Hyundai, for their cars being too easy to break into. Auto theft is up over 100% this year and 234% over the last two years in Chicago. Now, some may think that the issue is that people are stealing cars that don't belong to them. And, you know, you can actually blame those people because they have minds and a free will and volition. And they made the choice to forcefully break into a car, bypass the ignition and hotwire that car and then drive off with someone else's property. However, Mayor Johnson blames the cars themselves. It's kind of like blaming the victim, except in this case, it's an inanimate object with no mind or will or volition. Of course, if it is a Kia, it may have a soul. Wow. What does this approach expose about soft on crime policies and how people respond to the incentives that they are given? We have a news article from a local Fox affiliate in Chicago. Mayor Johnson mocked for suing automakers for car thefts. The numbers speak for themselves. Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson is facing backlash after filing suit against Kia and Hyundai over claims that they manufactured cars that lack appropriate anti-theft measures, ultimately leading to a surge in car crimes. Democratic ALD, I don't know what that means, Raymond Lopez Mock Johnson over the lawsuit on Fox and Friends, calling the move a play from a socialist playbook as crime continues to ravage streets in the Windy City. Clearly, we don't have a crime problem. We have a Kia problem. That's a good joke in the city of Chicago, according to Mayor Johnson. Lopez told Steve Ducey on Monday, the numbers speak for themselves. 104% increase from last year, a 234% increase in vehicle thefts from two years ago. But yet... It's the car's fault. It's the fact they're so easily taken by criminals who run rampant in the city of Chicago. But we have yet to say, hear our mayor say anything, one word about the criminals running rampant in the streets. This is such a, an interesting and very pointed critique of a lot of legislation that has been put out at the, the local level, the level of cities, the level of states, a lot of things that you hear about, echoes of and whispers of, they're just not popular enough at the federal level. All of these things that are considered soft on crime, things like uh, no cash bail, where if you are caught for something, then you pretty quickly go to a trial and a lot of the times at this trial, you are put out on bail without having to put any cash up. And what cash would do is it would force people to have to come up with a certain amount of money if they want to you know, leave their incarceration. And however you feel about that, the actual results are that people are committing crimes of high dollar prop property theft, auto theft in the case of this specific story. People are sometimes even committing somewhat violent crimes. And they're out on the streets within days, sometimes within hours. And we just know statistically that when somebody commits a crime and they feel like they get away with that crime, even if they spend you know, a night in jail and they go back out, um, they are highly likely to continue doing the criming, okay? And we're seeing this as crime statistics run out of control uh, across our country in major cities with soft on crime policies. They're also really, really reducing sentencing and reducing consequence on things, especially like auto theft, uh, no maximum sentences. Here's what it comes down to. Most people are just incentive driven machines. Now that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that that kind of becomes the status quo of life where we're just responding to incentive because that is humans who have the ability to live lives of purpose and meaning and to set goals for their future and to create strategies in order to execute on those goals. It takes all of that that God gave us as these unique creatures, unique among all creation, created in the image of God, and it brings us down really to our base level, our 
almost animalistic instincts where we just responding to stimulus. We're just responding to incentive. It's, it's just a few notches above just living off of instinct, living off of incentive. This is what James, the half brother of Jesus said, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. He's kind of laying out this path of how we get to these poor decisions that we make. And even a step beyond that of when we live in this way, where we allow ourselves to be enticed by our desires, when we give constantly into the temptation of perverse incentives around us, then it leads to sin, which is breaking God's desire and design for our life. That is laid out for us pretty clearly in the scripture. Most importantly, Jesus said to love God and to love the people around you. Well, stealing someone's car is certainly not loving the people around you. Breaking into someone's business is not loving someone around you. Robbing somebody, you know, hurting somebody, murdering someone. So when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then sin, this kind of lifestyle where you're constantly giving into the temptation of perverse incentives, when you're constantly dragged away by your evil desires, when you're constantly enticed, when desire is conceived, when you're constantly living in this sin, and when many, many, many people are doing this, it gives birth to death. It gives birth to the kind of statistics that are driving people out of major American cities. It, it's, it gives birth to homicide rates in many of our American major cities that are act actually becoming as high and some significantly higher than third world countries who for all of us growing up were like the places that you didn't go visit because it was so dangerous and the homicide rate was so high. We have major American cities now who are getting up to those kinds of levels. The idea that you can address this issue by suing Kia, by suing Hyundai, this is like suing a pencil manufacturer because somebody keeps making spelling errors. I mean, this is so wild. Um, auto theft is a symptom. The laws incentivizing criminal behavior, that's the actual disease. And the car manufacturers aren't even a part of the mathematical equation. Um, they're just making cars. And apparently what happened is some some Kias and some Hyundais, especially older ones, they have a, a pretty easy way to get the ignition going. And people started posting this on TikToks and stuff showing. And then the specific, you know, uh, theft of those types of cars skyrocketed. It went through the roof. Well, whose fault is that? This is so, this is so wild. If you take it to the symptom and the disease, this is like trying to cure diabetes for by like suing little Debbie's for being too delicious. You know, you're not addressing the behaviors that are driving this. You're, this is the weirdest form of victim blaming ever, like ever in the world. In Ezekiel 18, he, the prophet goes through this whole concept of how the sons don't get punished for the sins of the father. And what it says kind of over and, and over again is that the one who sins must die. And this is what justice means. Justice requires consequence that matches action. Justice requires consequence that matches action. Justice, quite simply defined, is getting what you deserve and not getting what you do not deserve. So we have two miscarriages of justice. Number one, the people who are committing these crimes are not getting any kind of consequence that matches that action. They're getting a slap on the wrist. They're getting put back on the streets. Um, you know, you've seen kind of related to this in many American major cities. You're seeing shoplifting just go through the absolute roof. You're seeing huge, huge companies who are pulling out of major American cities or who are laying off vast swaths of workers because they're saying we just have too much merchandise being stolen from our stores. Well, when you have cities who say we're not prosecuting shoplifting below $950, then people just grab their tr like trash bags and walk into your store and steal your stuff. It's a huge miscarriage of justice. Justice is getting what you deserve. And when you break laws, you deserve consequence. 
Justice is also not getting what you do not deserve. And so the miscarriage of justice goes two ways because the Walgreens who now are having things just ripped from their shelf, they do not deserve that and they're getting it anyway. And Kia and Hyundai do not deserve to be sued because some people choose out of their own free will and volition to respond to perverse incentives in the law and order of their major cities and steal someone else's property. All of it is just so backwards, so upside down. And there's kind of a a comparison out there right now that quite a few people are talking about. And that comparison is El Salvador. El Salvador is one of those Central American countries that for the longest time, you were just advised not to travel to because the homicide rate was so high. it, It truly was a dangerous place. This is from the Wall Street Journal. The country with the highest murder rate now has the highest incarceration rate. It says, El Salvador, long whipsawed by gang violence that made it one of the world's most dangerous countries, turned things around by jailing huge swaths of its population. The country once known for having the world's highest murder rate now has the world's highest incarceration rate, about double that of the U.S. Since March 2022, President Nayib Bukele's government has implemented a campaign to arrest en masse suspected members of the MS-13 and 18th Street gangs that have long terrorized the impoverished Central American nation, blocking economic growth and stoking U.S.-bound migration. The strategy has helped lower homicides by 92% compared with 2015, giving Bukele the support of nine out of every 10 Salvadorans Paul poll show. The number of Salvadorians illegally crossing the U.S. border, Mexico border, has dropped by 44%, a 92% reduction in the homicide rate. Um, Back a few years ago, their homicide rate was something like 52 for every 100,000 people in the country, and now it's down at like seven. Now it's significantly lower than New Orleans, significantly lower than Chicago. El Salvador made sure that justice was served by having consequence that matches action. Now, the argument from many people, especially people with a strong humanitarian bent, is that they're moving so quickly and they're doing things like trying a hundred gang members at a time. And I mean, just hearing that, it sounds like trying a hundred people at a time would make it very difficult for every single one of those people to actually get to make their case. And so they are saying they think that there are some innocent people who are also being imprisoned and jailed, especially people who are in these impoverished communities and may not be able to, to take up for themselves. That's an issue too. It's an issue on the other side of the equation because justice requires consequence that matches action. And if there are people who are being imprisoned, what they're in right now is what I think is almost a natural law, which is like the natural law of overcorrection. Gangs were running El Salvador and now they have overcorrected to like we're rounding everyone up. We're trying them all in one day and we're throwing all of them in prison. You have to be careful about that as well. You have to temper that. What we want is justice and what God calls for is justice in his world and for his people to stand up for justice. And that should be our call. And it is not loving to allow people to escape the natural consequence of their actions. And I think that sometimes Christians fall into that. We have very soft hearts. And we have a humanitarian bent. And so we will become enablers of poor behavior, not allowing people to suffer the consequences of their action. And God set up a world of action, reaction, of consequence, natural consequence. And it's important for us to have the appropriate boundaries, including in our law and order system, to allow people to come under those consequences because God uses consequence to draw us to himself. That's part of his discipline. That's part of how he lovingly brings his children to himself. I hope you enjoyed this clip from the Clayton Tyner podcast. If you want to watch the full podcast, you can check that out somewhere right around here. And if you want to subscribe, you can do that right over here somewhere. Also, you can follow me at Clayton Tyner. That's T-Y-N-E-R on Twitter and Instagram. I would love for you to subscribe to the channel so you can keep up with everything that we're doing.